Hello y'all and welcome back. So we're discussing strengths of utilitarianism, which again, I define as the view that right and wrong are to be understood in terms of the maximization of pleasure, benefit, or utility. The third strength of utilitarianism is that it captures how we explain morality. If you want to uh, expand this a bit, how we explain morality at a fundamental level. Now I understand there's a substantial amount of explanation involved in the examples I gave in the previous video where I'm explaining to Jasper why it's wrong to bite. But here I mean like explanation, explanation, like deep down explanation. So here's what I'm referring to. You're going to explain morality, very generally speaking, in terms of one of two paradigms. So you're going to reach for a naturalistic, what we might call, not incorrectly, an atheistic paradigm. Or you're going to reach for a supernaturalistic, which is almost invariably some form of religious paradigm to explain where we get morality, the phenomenon of holding and acting on beliefs about moral right and wrong. Now, let's begin with our naturalistic friends. How do they explain morality? They all, and I do mean all, explain morality in terms of an evolutionary paradigm. And you're familiar with this explanation because you've heard it. Long ago, when human beings were developing, we noticed that certain behaviors maximize the fitness of the social group. So if I tell you the truth about a source of fresh water or a herd of animals, that maximizes benefit for the entire social group. Uh, conversely, if when you and I get in a disagreement, I pull out my club and club you over the head and kill you, or if I just am taking people's sexual partners indiscriminately and causing drama and tension, that harms the fitness of the social group. So, being perceptive and wanting to maximize the fitness of the social group, we came to christen these beneficial behaviors good, and we came to christen the people who displayed them good in some sort of special moral way. And the people who displayed the other kind of behaviors, the harmful behaviors, we came to christen them bad and discourage those behaviors and, and give different penalties or punishments. We ostracized them. We wouldn't you know, associate with them as much and so on and so forth. And over time, this came to harden into an actual morality, the idea that there is above and beyond just raw benefit, some sort of sense of good and bad that you just should be as a human being. Some version of this story, at any rate, is going to be a naturalistic, broadly evolutionary paradigm. Now, what is that? That is utilitarianism. That just is a utilitarian view. An evolutionary explanation of morality is a utilitarian explanation of morality. It cashes out moral good and bad in terms of benefit might not be benefit to the individual, but it's benefit to the social group, benefit more generally. Now what about our supernaturalist friends? What about our religious friends? What of them? I had the opportunity not too long ago to take a look at a Sunday school curriculum. Now this particular curriculum was for first, second, and third graders, so roughly ages six through nine. And this particular lesson was about the Ten Commandments that Moses presents to uh, Israel in the book of Exodus. And there was a, a series of questions and answers that the teacher was supposed to present to the students. Ask them a question, then they discuss it, and then, and then they give the answer. And one question was, why did God give us the Ten Commandments? Now, as an ethicist, I find this a very intriguing question, because I can think of you know, six or seven different answers you could give. You could say, well, God you know, gave us the Ten Commandments because he wants us to be more like him. He wants us to be like God. Uh, or you could say, well, you don't ask why God does stuff. You just obey him. It's the way it works. That is not what this curriculum said. What the curriculum said was, God gave us the Ten Commandments because he wants us to live long, happy, and healthy lives. God gave us the Ten Commandments because he wants us to live long, happy, and healthy lives. Now, say what you will about this answer. That is straight up the middle utilitarianism. Right and wrong exist. They come from God. Why? Because they're good for us. Because they benefit us in some way. God's looking out for us. He wants us to flourish, so he gives us these moral rules. And it is fascinating to me that this unambiguously religious supernaturalist explanation of morality, the origin of morality, and this naturalist, unambiguously atheist explanation of morality, the origin of morality, both are clearly and unambiguously utilitarian. And the utilitarian says this illustrates better than any other point uh, that I could make why we are right doesn't matter what your paradigm is, whether you're deeply religious or atheistic, when the chips are down, when you need to explain right and wrong, you reach for benefit. You reach for what is best for us ultimately. You reach, in other words, for utilitarianism. So three very prominent strengths of utilitarianism. Again, clear action, guidance, 
captures how we talk about morality at kind of an everyday level and captures how we uh, explain morality at a much deeper and fundamental level. But utilitarianism is not a perfect view, and there are a number of concerns you could raise against it. The one that I'm going to spend the most time on here uh, is a version of kind of a common objection, but I'll present it this way. So um, all my favorite philosophers are dead, like all the Lucy Vert's friends. Uh, but my favorite living philosopher is no doubt Rosalind Hursthouse. Uh, she is a Kiwi, she's from New Zealand, and she has authored uh, many books and articles um, re representing tremendous insight into ethics. My favorite is her 2000 book on virtue ethics, which uh, is a bit of a misnomer because this book touches all aspects of ethics. And in it, she presents this thought experiment. Or, sorry, not, not really a thought experiment, it's more of an, an example, okay? So she says, there's a guy and he's a bad guy, he's a bad dude. And he's especially unscrupulous in his interactions and dealings with women. He lies to women, he manipulates them, etc. Does whatever it takes to get them amenable to his purposes. And in his kind of signature move here, terrible guy, is he'll find women who kind of want to get married. They want that long-term lifetime commitment and he'll promise to marry them to get them amenable to his purposes. And doing this, he has gotten two women pregnant. He's gotten two different women pregnant by promising to marry each of them. And he wakes up one morning and realizes, this is wrong. I've gone too far. He says, I I've had it with being a bad guy. I don't want to be a bad guy anymore. I want to be a good guy. He says, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. And from this moment forward, I will only do the right thing. The only consideration in anything I do, any action, is what is the right thing to do. That's it. And the first thing he does when he needs to do the right thing in this situation with the two women, both of whom he has gotten pregnant by promising to marry them, is he goes to you. Because you are the best person he knows, and you are his friend. So he goes to you. And he says, here's the deal. I've gotten two women pregnant by promising to marry both of them, and I want to do the right thing. What should I do? So, what do you tell him? This is the scenario. I want you to, uh, after this video is wrapped up, answer it in the discussion as fully as you can. Give your rationale, and we'll pick up in the next video analyzing what I call the ethical scumbag. Thanks.